Hello there, my name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Lancashire's River Loon is without doubt one of the best game fishing rivers in the northwest of England, particularly for salmon and for sea trout. Not unexpectedly then, besides catering for angling interests, it also has a long tradition of licensed commercial activity too. I suppose it's understandable, particularly in the lean years, that both sides of the fishing fraternity sometimes feel little in the way of kinship for each other. But if done sustainably, which I know is the case with the centuries old technique of hafe netting, the threat to future salmon and sea trout stocks is very much more perceived than it is real. So to better understand things from the commercial fishing point of view, I decided to spend a day in the company of husband and wife licensed salmon netters Margaret and Trevor Owen, working out from Sunderland Point. What follows is an audio interview with Margaret, after first spending the day afloat filming with Trevor, fishing in partnership with one of the other licensed salmon netters. And just as a point of interest, although quite a few place and flounder, plus three bass and a nice soul were caught, the two drift nets and Margaret's hafe net did not take a single salmon or sea trout between them. As most people will probably never even have heard of a hafe net, the first obvious question then is to have you explain what it is and its origins. I think the hafe net, well I do know the hafe netting came from the Viking time and that's where they get the name half net, heave net or have net, it's all different spellings of it but it came from the Viking. It's an easy way to catch salmon and sea trout or any other kind of fish if it comes to it. And then, of course, it came over to England and it spread round England and eventually came to the River Loon. And I think the River Loon, the word Loon means something, Norway type of thing. And um, it's been progressed on the River Loon ever since. There used to be 36 licenses on the Loon and then it dropped to 26. And now there's only 12. And to actually have one, you've got to be a full-time fishing person or earn most of your living from fishing. But it's unusual to find a woman holding a commercial salmon fishing licence. In fact, I believe you're the only one in the country. So how did all that come about? Was you born into a fishing family? Did you marry into it? Or perhaps it was just simply something you wanted to do? Well, I met my husband and he always was a fisherman. We came to live up here 30 odd years ago and I used to see the men doing it and I thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. But I've always been intrigued by the water. I just love the water and the fishing. And um, people didn't think I'd be able to lift and carry the beam. Well, men actually thought I wouldn't lift and carry the beam. But actually, it's not the weight of the beam. It's the knack of lifting it. Once you get it up and on your back, you're off. And to have is just another world. I can't explain it to you. You're on your own twice a day, four hours each tide doing the ebb. And you can do the flood for four hours. And the atmosphere, the scenery, the nature, the night time, everything is amazing. The adrenaline rush when you catch a fish is out of this world. It is unbelievable. Isn't standing during fast flowing water twice a day for four hours stints not a bit on the boring side? Maybe even dangerous too. Well, it's never boring because from the minute you go in, especially where I'm standing at the moment, the tide is running so hard when you're halfway in, you can hardly hold the beam. You're concentrating all the time. If you're fishing on sand, the sand can be moving under your feet. It's really, really a way of fishing that you've got to get your mind round it. Time passes quickly, but you know that you're a good haver when you're not thinking about anything. Suddenly you realise your mind's not full of anything. People say, what do you think about? Well, the truth is, when you're a haver, it's like a, a form of meditation, I would think. You get so carried away with the whole thing. You're not thinking of anything, really. And it's just the adrenaline rush when you catch the fish. Now, it is dangerous. Once I misfooted years ago and disappeared down the river, the net wrapped around me. But I'm here to tell the tale. The lifeboat did turn out and another haver did save me. But... It's any job's dangerous, but it did go back in the next day. But people say, do you fish in the night? Well, the night's even better than the day. People say they see a shooting star. Well, I've seen cascades of stars that nobody would believe. And the phosphorescence in our water in here in August, it's like Disneyland. It's just lit up all the time. It is totally amazing. It sounds to me like the type of job that you'd need a particular mindset to persevere with and enjoy. But you seem more than capable of handling it. And despite what some people might have thought, of handling the net itself as well. So describe to us just exactly what it looks like, how it works and its effectiveness. Well a hate net, to an ordinary person that's never seen one, the best way to say is imagine a goal post, what you have you know in the playing football, it's an 18 foot 6 beam with a net on like a goal post and it's about waist high so I make mine, you have to make them yourself, you can't go to a shop and buy them 
it's pitch pine, an 18 foot 6 piece of pitch pine that you sand down till it's very fine, about the, the width of your wrist if you can possibly get it. The end sticks are green art, there's one at each end and then a post in the middle. Then I get a sheet of netting of which I knit the sides up and I put it on in a bag, just like goals in a football. Then I, I lift the beam, twist on the back of my back and down to the river I go. I drop the beam and I stand behind it so you have to imagine a goalie in a football stands in front while I stand at the back with the net either side of me. I stand there with my hands spread out holding the middle beam resting on my shoulder to take the weight of the water because sometimes the pressure of the water can knock you off your feet. And the big rule is when you're having, when you go in, always step back three paces and make sure it's safe because it's no use waiting until you catch a fish and you step back and disappear down the hole. Now the art of aving is to be quiet and still. Sometimes the fish can literally slither past your leg. Other times you get the faintest, and I mean the faintest, tiniest twitch on your fingers. And if the grills, which grills are salmon, they're only up to about seven pound, they're frightfully quick. And you've got to get the beam up, and they're in the back of the bag. And you have to bear in mind that this fish, you're fighting to catch it to pay your wages, but that fish is fighting for its life. So you have to get it up. Grab the fish while the water's going past you like 10 mile an hour train or 50 mile an hour train sometimes. Keep your foot in, grab the fish, kill it. Get it on your rope and put it to the back. Put your net down as quick as you can because there's always a particular time that you find over the weeks your fish, which is commonly known as the killing time. And so you need to get your net back in that water because there's near enough another fish coming behind you. Now, the thing is with Haven, you've got to be patient but you also have got to be very alert as well because like I said they can whip in and do now the biggest salmon are completely different usually when you get a, a large salmon say between 16 and 20 pounds it can hardly pull the net it's the grill set of the ones that fight and sometimes you get a tiny twitch and up you get and there it is laid in the back of your net it's amazing you also get different things like bass caught in your net which are tricky because they've got the spikes on the back and flatties are a nuisance because you think you've got a terrific fish and you pick it up and it's a silly old flatty. Now 2012, as we all know, has been a particularly bad year for all aspects of fishing, in the main due to the heavy and at times persistent rainfall coming down the rivers and entering the sea. Nobody I know of has been immune from at least some of its effects. So from your point of view, how has this affected you? Give us an insight into weather-related problems for hafe net fishing. It's the fresh water, like you said. The fresh water has ruined the fishing for everybody. The sea trout and the, and the salmon, especially the sea trout in June, everybody missed completely. All I caught were three out of, out of the whole of June, which was more than we caught last year because it was the same last year. When it rains, it dilutes the river right to the bottom. So consequently, these salmon and, and sea trout, they come sailing up and they've been in the salt water. I have to rely on the fact that the salmon and the sea trout do not like fresh water. So when they're coming up the river, they get up to me and the fresh water starts to be there and they don't like the taste and they drop back into my net. Well, when it's rained, this is where they get the saying that anglers love the rain. People think every fisherman likes rain, but we don't, net people don't. Because what happens is the fresh water has diluted the river right down to the sea. So the fish start to come up and by the time they get up to where we are, they're used to the fresh water. So instead of dropping back, off they go, right up the river. And so it's been absolutely terrible. Last year, I'd never even covered my licence. This year, I've just about covered it now. When you think it's your living, and you're paying, I should pay £300 for mine, and I stand twice a day minimum, four hours a tide, it's a lot of work for nothing, but it's just a way of life we have. And because people say, oh, well, why do you do it? Because it goes in the cycle that we do. We're proper fishing people. So we, f we do the salmon in the summer, shrimping and, and so on and so forth, all the way through the year. And it's just part of our cycle. Some years you have good years and some years you don't. We always say to the anglers, if they ask, any anglers welcome to come with us. Because they usually think that we've pinched all the salmon and the sea trout. What they don't realise is if there isn't any fish for them, there definitely is no fish for us. And that's how it works. We're only allowed to fish Monday to Friday, 6 o'clock we go in and come out Saturday morning and four hours twice a day sounds a lot but there's such a big river that it's really it's a real good way of fishing because it helps the fish go up and down and, and keeps the job going because as fishing people making our living we need them to be plenty of fish but nobody that fishes properly wants to wipe them out 
You want them to be there for next year. You want them to go up and spawn. You need it to be a healthy, good river. And are there any discernible differences between the catch rates and distribution for salmon and for sea trout? The uh, sea trout are June. And you don't really get many sea trout July and August. Usually the grills, the, these that are about £8, they come in end of July, August. Well, usually July. This year they've not even come in and we're, we're uh, well into the first week in August. It's very poor. In the last few weeks I've seen four boats go down with 320 yards of net and not one fishing boat come back with a fish. There just wasn't anything. But once they come in, they will, and they will come in, we sometimes wonder, the Environment Agency had a project going a few years ago and they released them later. And so I suppose they're coming back later. We always take our nets out of the water the last day of August and the first and the second week of September you see them all popping up. They might as well be waving and saying, hi, up we go, we're on our way. But they do all come up and the counter counts it to prove it. But it's just, at the moment, they're just not, they're just not here, they're not coming up. And as a measure of additional support for what you've just said, your husband, Trevor, operates his licensed gill net covering a bigger expanse of water than you do. Yet I believe he's also been struggling throughout this summer too. The gill nets are a monofilament on the drift nets, the, the thing. It's just the same, the drift net people are just the same, they've suffered terribly. And they were saying about gill nets, there are gill nets in the bay that are fishing for bass, so we usually know if they've got an odd one stuck in them, and nobody's getting them. They're, they're just, they've not come into the bay, and that's all there is to it. But um, the Whammel boats, they pay nearly £700 for their licence just for June, July and August, and their return has been terrible, terrible. Having done this type of fishing for a good number of years in the same spot, you obviously will have your finger on the pulse in terms of seasonal numbers and fluctuations of fish. So what, if any, trends have you noticed? What cycles and trends have occurred during your fishing time? All right, I started 21 years ago. So I haved for five years, and then I drifted with like, the chaps with my own boat, 320 yards of net, for 11 years, and then I'm back having. So I've done all aspects, so I know the situation. Now, about six years ago, everybody said, oh, doom, gloom, you know, overfishing and, and all the rest of it. And blow me, the year after, we had the most tremendous season. And I mean tremendous. It was everybody, the anglers, us. That's why people should know that when there's fish for the anglers, there's fish for us. And it's just, I'm a believer that perhaps we as people count a cycle as a year. But, you know, we don't know, do we, really? It could be a five-year cycle or a four-year cycle that, and they move round and come in at different times. Because if it was what they said, three years ago in particular, over on the East Coast, they were landing them in the bucketfuls and the boatfuls. There were that many sea trouts, it swamped the market. And prior to that, four years ago, um, it was, oh, there'll never be any sea trout again, according to the anglers. And then it was this massive influx. And when I say it swamped the market, it was unbelievable. The price dropped to rock bottom. It didn't do anybody any favours or anything, but it proves that, yes, they are there. We're just not waiting for the cycle to come round. And in your opinion, this is a sustainable way of fishing for salmon and sea trout? It is really sustainable because they're only small boats, small people. I'm not a believer in factory ships. I think if everybody fished, I know people have to live and people have to be fed, but if everybody did it the traditional way and did away with or the new technology sort of thing that spot the fish. If everybody went back to trawling and fishing in these traditional ways, like the whammerlin, there's no fancy gadgets on the boat. It's you and the fish. It's not you and all your equipment and the fish. It's just you and the fish. I think it would the whole world would be more sustainable. You go out, you catch, you catch. If you don't, you don't. And life goes on. And, you know, the marine life benefits from it as well. I take it that you also pick up species other than salmonids in both types of net albeit that they aren't being specifically targeted. Yeah, today I actually got a bass, but they're usually in the dark, but today I got one in the daylight. You get mullet. I had um, an Alice Shad once in the early days, which I, I reported to the agency, and they came up and had a look at. And if you were whammeling, when I used to whammel, you'd often get different little bits of fish. You, you're always getting place and, uh, and flatties, but sometimes you get masses of mackerel when you're um, whammeling. It's quite interesting, really. So what exactly is whammeling? Whammeling is drift netting. Sorry, that's drift netting. It's what Trevor does now, what I did. It's a boat, 320 yards of net. You set off at the, a pointer on the river. You shoot your net and you've got a lot of trickiness to keep it in a straight line and you'd go straight the way down to where the river meets the sea, which we call the drop-off. 
Now down at the drop-off, people and the anglers and the fishermen, I think the one thing we have in common is the fact that seals are the biggest threat to fish, never mind man. Down at the bottom of the river, when there are fish, you can tell when the fish are because the seals come, you've worked all day and you've got your net out and your fish strike and it's like a dinner bell. The seals just come swimming along and all you're left with in your net can be three, four, five, six heads in your net and the seals laying on its back eating them. I think as human beings we should really start and put human beings first. I'm a big believer in conservation but this seal situation is totally and absolutely getting out of hand. They're eating more fish than human beings. And I mean, people, I know they're lovely things to look at, and I know they live in the sea, but they're spreading like a plague, and they're damaging the fish resources all around the world. You mentioned earlier, in connection with the Alice Shad, contacting the Environment Agency, which coincidentally was my pre-retirement employer. What is the situation currently with the agency wanting to, for want of a better way of putting it, retire salmon fishing licences in an effort to phase out this type of fishing altogether? Well, for some reason on the River Loon they can't do it. I don't know what it is. Something was written in years ago. But they seem to be closing down the fisheries all around the country. And there again, they're doing it for the, probably the reasons they're saying, you know, conservation, protecting the fish, which is really a joke going back to the seals. They should take a look at the, what's eating the fish and, and what's doing. Men's livelihood seems to be very secondary. Fish is for fishermen. And if they kept it that way, and, and fair enough, cut down on the people that just do it as... These, they can get unemployed people that cash in on it, that cause problems, whether it's shellfish or salmon or sea trout. But fish is for fishermen, and fishermen have been on this earth since the year dot. And they're getting pushed out. Well, they're getting pushed out not only by our own environment agency, they're getting pushed out with the rest of the world. I mean, we must be the only nation that does as we're told. We follow everything to the letter. We don't catch undersized fish and everything. Spanish and all the other people, they just wipe our waters out and we're getting pushed further and further inshore and it's absolutely tragic. And people like the Environment Agency, well, they're just helping that, the demise of the fishing industry. And am I right in thinking that for the type of fishing you do, salmon farming is another potential nail in your coffin? Well, no, you see, the salmon farming, actually, as a fisherwoman, you probably think, oh, she doesn't like salmon farming, but I've nothing against salmon farming. At least it's feeding the world and keeping people going. I mean, I'm never bothered about it because their product is nowhere near as good as my product at all. I would be cross if they stopped me fishing for salmon and the farms went on, but somebody's to provide the goods for the people to eat. And it's a better way than letting them, you know, these troll, these thousand yards of net that they put out, that does the salmon as well. They catch fish indiscriminately. They say they're going for one species and they're not. They're going for anything they can, you know. But no, salmon farming, everything's got a place and it's feeding people. As long as they up the game and keep the fish healthy, I'm not a believer in these chemicals they put in and the fish are weary and the little adipose fins on the back are all floppy and whoever wants to eat them is welcome to them. I like a nice, fresh, pink, muscly salmon that's fought its way from the ice cap up here. You can't whack it. Having so much inferior quality fish, if you can call it that, on the market, does that not have the effect of pushing up the prices for genuine wild fish? No, the price of the wild fish, compared to what it was 20 years ago, the price of salmon is just sort of steady. I mean, you got more a pound or a kilo 20 years ago than you do now, if you are, you know, did the money transfer sort of thing. It was worth a lot more, but that was in the days when people could only go to a fishmonger and buy a bit of cod and place. Now they can go to the fishmonger and buy the world, can't they? It's people that like fresh salmon like it, and if you haven't tried it, you've given to clue. You go to the shop, buy your fish, and eat it. You need to be a nice connoisseur of that fish to appreciate a fresh salmon. Anglers, of which I am one, as we all know, don't like anybody other than ourselves taking fish, and that includes by people like yourself. Meanwhile, back in the real world, we all really need to get on and collectively do what's best, or at least what is shown to be sustainable. But in salmon and sea trout, we also have one of those rare situations where a little bit of additional input from, say, the Environment Agency could certainly help things along too. More and better protection of reds and wildfish at spawning time would be one way forward. But a far easier, more effective and arguably cheaper way would be simply to farm more fish for release, which the EA used to do but have since cut back on. Or is introducing farm fish the thin end of the wedge in terms of maintaining genetic integrity? 
What are your thoughts? Well, yeah, I do, really. And I must say about the bailiffs, I think the, I've got to say we have a bailiff called Matthews. I think he's one of the head bailiffs. And he does a really good job, does Matthew. He gets to know people. He visits regularly. The only thing the fishermen think about that is perhaps time could be spent. I think the, the environment agency should employ more people like Matthew and, and more time could be spent educating people on, you know, not poaching but I think wherever you are you're going to always get somebody that poaches you can't do away with that now as far as the numbers go they, they used to have a brilliant program of introducing fish about 10 or 15 years ago we used to get a paper round and on this paper it would say that if you caught a fish with its adipose fin off that you reported it to the bail if they came it had a little microchip in its nose and they paid you a reward of 10 pounds paid for your fish and paid for your reward and that seemed to go very well. But then funding stops. It's like everything else. Money short, funding stops. I think the anglers pay an awful lot of money to do angling. And I think the landowners could put more back into the river. They're always saying about us catching fish. But we are providing fish to feed people. And our fish is worth a lot of jobs by the time you catch the fish. We get paid. The environment agency get paid for looking after us. We get paid. The bailiff gets paid person in the shop gets paid, the filleter gets paid and I know they say that it's supposedly for leisure and everything but I really feel that these people that are charging the poor anglers vast amount of money they could perhaps put more back in than they do really and they should really get to grips with the fact that the, the netsmen don't take all the fish. We all want to live and we all want the fish to be there and we want people to have a good time catching it. I mean, if I wasn't doing this, and when I get older and everything, I definitely would turn into an angler. I've got to have the thrill of the tug of the fish. I get a buzz from that, just the same as the anglers do. Even when you've got 320 yards of net out, you're in that boat, and you're holding that rope on 320 yards, and you feel that tug. And then you see that splash, and that fish comes out of the water. It's a feeling that if you don't know about it, you just don't know what you're missing, I'll tell you. Landowners doing more, though, to some extent, requires the consent and cooperation of the Environment Agency. They can't suddenly decide one day to stock a river without the necessary paperwork first being in place. That being the case, would it not be better for the Environment Agency themselves to reassume that particular role? I do, and I think they do. I mean, we joke about the Environment Agency and call them the Entertainment Agency and, and everything, but I do admire them because they do prosecute people. They do bring people to task. They're absolutely fantastic on that, and that's what you've got to admire them, to get things done. And I'm quite sure that if they were allowed to put more investment in and recruit people, I mean, a few years ago there was a non-recruitment thing. I think the shorter staff, and you can't produce good results if you haven't got the staff, and these, the staff they have do a, a real good job, but they need backup, and the, they are excellent. They do better than um, perhaps the sea fisheries, but the sea fisheries uh, have hardly any staff at all. But they don't prosecute. The Environment Agency have got the knack. They catch somebody, they prosecute. I don't believe in prosecuting little kids about 9, 10 or 11. That went over the mark when they were trying to do that. Prosecute people that know they're doing wrong. And um, I think the money they get off the prosecutions, they could plough back into getting juvenile fish back into the rivers. For the sake of people listening in, both you and I are sitting members of the Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authority North West Region. And as I mentioned earlier, I also previously worked for the Environment Agency, so we are both quite keen in our own different ways in seeing that things are done right. And you're quite right in saying that while the EA will readily prosecute, IFCA rarely if ever does. So who, I wonder, has got the balance right? Earlier this year at an IFCA meeting, I made a tentative approach to see about going for a bylaw proposal to increase the minimum size for bass from its current 36cm to 45cm, only to be told it would be opposed, as they hadn't the manpower to enforce it. But increasing it from one statutory limit to another surely doesn't require any more manpower than they already had, as they were already supposed to be enforcing the lower limit anyway. Well, they don't want to enforce it, but I don't think fishermen would go along with it, you see, because the, the thing is, if you increase it to 45, you're taking the wrong size of fish for the breeding programme. The balance of fish is just right. The fish are doing well. The stocks are coming out and going back in. If you start changing the, the balance of that fish size, you're in trouble with the bass. Bass, as you'll know, some feed offshore, some feed inshore. And they find the size that you're wanting to put it up to, they're the size that would... Well, the inshore fishermen wouldn't get the fish. They'd fish off. The size of the fish would go off. And the 
only people that would gain would be the Spanish and the inter people coming from the international waters. They would catch the fish. We wouldn't get the fish at all. It would do the inshore fishermen if they altered. That's what the bass situation was. We had a, quite a fight to get that overturned. I don't think Brodsman realised the importance of keeping the bass size as it was. It's one of those things, why mend it if it's not broken? I think we'll have to disagree on that one. The population's healthy, everything's in balance, the fish come in, they go out. We've got the increase in the bass when we've got the power station because of the warm water. And while I'm on about fish and everything, the Environment Agency do a brilliant job and the IFCA do a good job and the anglers do a good job and the next people do. And the people that let us down in the whole thing are the power stations. I brought it up and we have tried and we have tried and tried to do something about the power stations. The power station at Hesham has supposedly a bubble curtain that which I should think 80% of the year does not work. And there are skip loads of fish go out of the power station. They're sucked in, there's bass, there's salmon, there's sea trout, there's place, there's every kind of fish. And you know, believe it or not, it's a government body. And if you start looking into it, you come against a great big wall and there's nothing can do. So I can't understand when we're having these conversations and the anglers are worried and we're worried and everybody's worried. And then just because you're a government body, you're allowed to suck up and chuck these fish. I mean, when I say skip loads, I don't mean once a month. I mean every day and twice we have tried as an IFCA body to get to the bottom of it and the doors are closed, which is disgusting. Totally and absolutely. As an enforcement body, do we not have a statutory right of entry to enforce and gather evidence as we see fit? I am most certainly had in my days at the Environment Agency. With statutory rights to follow up, we have followed up and the door has been shut and nothing has come of it and the bubble curtain does not work. We've got complete proof and everything but it's a government body and it's a power station so somehow they get away with it. We're talking about the anglers complaining that the, the, the netsmen have got the fish. We're complaining that sea lions have got the fish. And at the end of the day, the people that have got the fish are the power station in the skip on the tip. But obstructing legally appointed officers in the pursuit of the duties, which IFCA enforcement officers are, is actually an offence in itself. I don't know why the anglers, because they're the money people in the, in the whole thing, don't get together as a body and challenge the power stations. I know I've challenged it twice and when they were going to put um, Power Station 2 at Hesham, that's when I brought it up again because I was absolutely horrified to think we would have had double sucking the fish in. It was frightening. Projecting things forward to the future now, how do you see commercial salmon fishing generally and what you do on the River Loon specifically going over the next couple of decades or so? Well, the future on the loon hopefully is quite safe because it's sustainable. They've got the numbers right. They've got seven drift nets or whammel nets and 12 have nets. Some of these licenses are in the hands of people that have jobs now, I'm sorry to say, but that's good for conservation because they don't go. And a couple of them belong to older people that are not fit to do the job as they should. So on the whole, it's quite safe. Now, around the country, Salmon fishing will be gone, it, they, they will just close it down and it will turn into the factory fish. But hopefully, you know, if they close everywhere down, just for tradition and just for the sake of keeping the history going, they should keep it on the loom. They've already taken the other one, the, um, there was the drift and the, can't think what, the draw net. We held the draw net. Once Trevor and me held it between us, it's jolly hard work. You row out, row around in a circle and pull it in. And you didn't really catch many, but it got you on the ladder to go and then go protest to a have and then to get your drift licence. Full-time working and elderly licence holders will help take some of the pressure off, but it's only temporary, as these licences don't die or retire with their owners. They simply get reissued to the next person on the list. No, I have to apply for my licence every year. And the good thing about this, the, the actually good thing about it, which again, which I admire the Environment Agency for, and people should take note of it, each year I apply for my licence and I have to send in my tax details to prove that I earn a part of my income from fishing. They want to know everything. It's not a matter of personal data and they can't look into it. They ask you for it. You've produced it. If you don't produce it, you don't get your licence. It's as easy as that. So some people like say, oh, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. The Environment Agency do it. I fill in a form every year. It's got to be where I live, how many years I've done it, how many hours I've fished if I'm fit to fish, and so on, this, the list goes out endlessly, and you get points all the way through, and if you don't get enough points, well, you don't get your licence. So 
they do the right job their application forms and it's every year it's not I've not got this license for as long as I live if I get ill and can't fish they would take it off me you know if I don't produce the goods and there's somebody better they will give it to somebody else you say that the fishing has to provide a substantial part of your income but what happens in a bad year such as 2012 dogged by weather conditions that make fishing turnover hardly worth the effort Oh no, well they're understanding, they know the weather, you just write the form up, I mean people are reasonable, everybody knows what's happened. And if you're fishing people like us, we just will probably make it up on either cockles or, well, so as long as we fish, they're not particularly say the salmon, as long as you fish for your living, you've got to do so much fishing for your living. But they do count the hours, and they do have a tag thing, which again, you can't go against the environment agency, they brought in a tagging system, but some of it's ridiculous. Because they go down in the boats, and today's a lovely nice day, but sometimes in the boats, on most days, it's blowing a gale, heaving it down, waves as high as mountains. I can be stood in with the hay being getting pushed off my feet, I'm wet through. But before you come out of the water, you've got to tag your fish. Right, now the drift net boats whiz in here sometimes like lightning, because the water pushes them in. But before they get in and out of that boat, let me tell you, every day I have a book in the boat, and the book's filled in, and the fish are tagged. I have the tags in my pocket as I catch a fish. I might put them on my string, but the minute I step out of the water, I tag the fish. So that means that nobody can sell those fish in a fish market without a tag. So that is clamping down on the poachers again. You buy a wild salmon from a fish market, it's got a tag in it. And that number tells you who caught it. You could go on a system and you'd find out I caught it. But the fishmonger cannot sell that fish without that tag to prove this is from a bona fide fisherman or woman. Would it be fair to say then that what you do as a licensed salmon hair netter can be summed up as very hard work for little return? Very hard work for very little return, but it's a bug. You can't live without it. <laughs> it's just a necessity. And I'll wager there's not many people these days who can say that about the way they make ends meet. My thanks then to Margaret Owen for explaining her side of the fishing debate and also for finishing up on such a positive and happy note. <laughs>